This begins our Chapter 10, Introducing Organic Chemistry. There will be four sections we will cover in our talk together, describing first, what is organic chemistry, and why do we make it a separate branch from all other fields of chemistry? The second key question, where do we obtain organic compounds? The third, how do we go about writing structural formulas of organic compounds? In the final section of our chapter, what are functional groups? And we'll be focusing on some specific functional groups one at a time that will further come up in their own chapters as we go through the journey. To begin with, organic chemistry should be defined. It is known as the study of compounds that contain carbon. Not only do we consider carbon, but generally speaking, we have a term that we might as well get familiar with. It's called a hydrocarbon. What two elements do you believe to be in the term hydrocarbon? Well, of course, you're right, hydrogen and carbon. The field of organic chemistry often deals with chains of, of uh, carbon compounds kind of in a link here, and these little dashed lines are going to represent the hydrogens that become attached to them. Often, organic compounds are hydrocarbons. I ran out of room, so I just put it to the side. If we have straight chains, these are known as alkanes with single bonds. Sometimes we'll have branch chains, sometimes we'll have double bonds and, and triple bonds, and all of those typical organic molecules will be discussed one at a time. So organic compounds are made up of carbon and only really a few other elements uh, specifically will have hydrogen involved. Often you'll find oxygen and some nitrogen. Also present in organic compounds might include some sulfur known as a thio group, phosphorus, and the halogens. Now that might be a new word or it might be a familiar word. Those are those elements found in group 7A on our periodic table. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine collectively are known as the halogens. Organic molecules are found in foods, flavors, and fragrances. They're found in our medicines, toiletries, and cosmetics. They are making up our plastics, films, fibers, and resins. They're found in paints, varnishes, and glues, and of course, in our bodies, and the bodies of all living organisms. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of organic compounds is that they involve the chemistry of carbon and really only a few other elements. And the way that those elements are linked together will create what we call those functional groups. When we think about organic chemistry and why we separate it from disciplines such as biochemistry or inorganic chemistry, we have analytical chemistry or physical chemistry, different branches, organic is a specialized field. One of the first reasons that chemists have decided to, this would be the first reason, is a historical reason that we separate the discipline from all others. Scientists at one time believed that they needed a, quote, vital force present in living organisms to produce an organic compound. So historically, we made no distinction between the field of biochemistry, those things found in living organisms, and the field of organic chemistry. They were indeed thought of one and the same. However, in the early days of chemistry, scientists thought organic compounds that produced living organisms and that inorganic compounds were those things found in rocks and other living non-matter, although now we can really see that there's a blend. Chemists believed that they would not, that they could not synthesize any organic compound by starting with inorganic compounds. That was what was known as this vital force. The vital force is something that created a living organism unexplainable by a scientist at the time. And so we had this scientist, Warler, back in 1828, who designed an experiment to prove indeed that you could create an organic molecule, which is something that would be found in a living organism, from inorganic molecules, very much a, a, a fledgling theory at that point in time in history. So let's take a look at what we have here. We have an inorganic salt called ammonium 
chloride. Ammonium is this positive polyatomic ion, NH4, carries a plus one. And chloride is a monatomic negative ion, carries a minus one. So this is commonly called to as a salt made of ions, a positive hook to a negative ion. We also have a salt called silver cyanate. Silver is a positive one charge. And this polyatomic ion is called cyanate. NCO and it carries a minus one. When we heat this strongly, and generally we draw a little triangle over an arrow to represent the heat, we get a compound called urea. And see this carbon in the center and a mean functional group on each side. And here we have a ketone functional group, a C double bond O all functional groups found in the organic chemistry field. And of course, really this is just a type of double displacement. You can see silver going to chloride and ammonium going to cyanate. But when we see that arrangement, this salt would be a precipitate. So it was a white solid precipitate. But they were able to actually isolate and purify an organic molecule known as urea. What this did was to lead to the demise of this whole theory that you could not start with inorganic reactants and produce an organic molecule. Of course, urea is found in living organisms. It's the compound found in urine. So this single experiment was sufficient to disprove this doctrine of the vital force. It took several years and a number of additional experiments for the entire scientific community to accept this fact that organic molecules could be synthesized in the laboratory. So what this means, the term organic and the term inorganic no longer had their original meaning. Organic compounds can be obtained from inorganic materials. The first reason organic chemistry was separated from all other branches in a historical sense is that organic molecules originally believed to contain a vital force, those things that are found in living organisms. This experiment disproved such a theory. There was a second major region that scientists put organic chemistry in its own field. And it really is just the sheer number of organic molecules. We have discovered over 10 million organic compounds. And an estimated 100,000 new ones are discovered or made each year in a laboratory setting. By far more organic molecules than any other division of chemistry. By comparison, chemists have discovered or made an estimated 1.7 million inorganic compounds. You can see this proof statistically 85% of all known compounds fall under this category of organic chemistry. So it is indeed worthy of a separation and division. The nomenclature for organic chemistry is very different from inorganic chemistry and a great deal of our time in the class will be learning in or, or excuse me, learning the organic nomenclature. And a third reason we separate organic chemistry into its own division, there's a very, very strong link to the field of biochemistry. So much so that we used to not distinguish between them when we believed in the vital force back in the uh, earlier part of historical chemistry. The biochemical field includes molecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, enzymes, and nucleic acids, hormones, vitamins, and almost all other chemicals in living systems are indeed organic compounds, a huge overlap in the field of biochem and organic chem. Of course, vitamins are organic molecules. Minerals found in our body are the inorganic compounds. So there's a distinction between a vitamin and a mineral based on the field of orgo and inorganic chemistry. So three very strong reasons why we separated the field of organic from all other branches. Let's take a look closely at table 10.1 from our chapter. It's on page 309 in our book. It compares organic and inorganic compounds. Organic compounds on the left column versus inorganic compounds on the right column. 
In organic molecules, bonding is almost entirely covalent. And this is simply meaning that non-metal hooked and non-metal are known as covalent molecules. They're going to share electrons. And when we think about drawing those structurally, we have that solid dashed line representing a shared pair of electrons. Now, conversely, ionic compounds have ionic bonds. Inorganic compounds tend to be ionic compounds made of positive cations hooked to negative anions where we try to neutralize the charge by doing the crisscross trick when we write their formula. Ionic compounds have ionic bonds and if you recall those are formed by what's called electron transfer. Organic molecules may be solids, liquids, or gases with very low melting points. Again, these are all characteristics of molecular compounds. Ionic compounds, which are inorganic salts, typically are solids at high, I can very think of very few uh, examples of, of exceptions here, solids with very high melting points. And again, think of these as commonly called salts. Organic molecules, most are insoluble in water, not all, but a good general rule is insoluble in water, making them um, typically nonpolar, although I can think of many exceptions to that rule. And typically over here, salts are soluble in water, but again, we know that there are many exceptions to the rule with this um, known term here called precipitate. If they are not soluble in water, they tend to be soluble in organic solvents, which are nonpolar molecules. Here's a list of examples of nonpolar molecules, such as diethyl ether, toluene, and dichloromethane. If salts are water soluble, they're going to be insoluble in organic solvents. And again, typically these will be nonpolar, not always, but I can come up with several examples that are. Aqueous solutions do not conduct electricity. We call those non-electrolytes. Aqueous solutions conduct electricity. Well, that term was called electrolytes. And we know that there are strong, weak, and non-electrolytes as discussed in, in an earlier course. Organic compounds almost all burn. Very few burn. Reactions are usually slow, always involve a catalyst for help, and reactions are often very fast. And again, these are generalizations, not steadfast laws, but generalizations that just give us a quick comparison of organic to inorganic compounds. Let's pause here and be sure before you start the lesson again, you have studied section 1 of 10. Start up again when ready.